If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. I've selected the 17th verse, which I consider one of the outstanding verses in this last chapter of the last book of the Bible. And it says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. It's been an exciting experience to be involved in the presentation of the book of Revelation. Marvelous. And as we come now to this concluding chapter, I would like to give you a bird's eye view of what we're talking about. And at the same time, those people who are listening to the book of Revelation on magnetic tape. I have gone to the chalkboard and I've drawn a half circle on the left-hand edge of the chalkboard and we have placed a large E, which is eternity. And now I'm going about two-thirds of the way over and I'm going to put another large half circle, eternity. And in between two eternities, God has placed approximately 7,000 years of recorded time. Now, God's placed more than 7,000 years, but approximately 7,000 years of recorded time are placed in between two eternities. God originally, in Genesis 1-1, made a perfect heaven and a perfect earth. Then we know that something happened, so God reached down, picked up a handful of dirt, and he formed a body, and he made a body of a man, breathed into that body the breath of life, and that dirt body became a living soul. And then from Adam to the first coming of Jesus Christ, 4,000 years. And then from the first coming to the second coming, and this is an assumption on my part. I do not have scripture for this, but looking at the overall plan of God relative to the 7,000 years of time in between two eternities, I have come to the general conclusion that God has placed 2,000 years between the first coming and the second coming. The second advent of Jesus Christ could take place by the year 2000. And then we know that once Jesus Christ comes down from heaven at the end of what we commonly refer to as the 70th week of Daniel, he comes to reign on the earth in what is known as the kingdom age or the millennial kingdom. He comes to rule on this earth for 1,000 years, a literal 1,000 years. So we have there 4,000 plus 2,000 plus 1,000 equals 7,000 years of recorded time placed in between two eternities. And then as we studied in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, we saw there's going to be a great general judgment known as the white throne judgment. And then while the saved as witnesses against the unsaved are all congregated at the white throne judgment. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 10 through 12, that all of this in the past is going to be destroyed by a tremendous fire an atomic fire, 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. So all of this will be destroyed by fire. And then as we studied in Revelation 21.1, we found that God is going to make new earth and he's going to make new heavens. And as far as I know, very few preachers go past this point right here. They put you in heaven, enjoying yourself and having hilarious time, and they stop there. But I'm going past 
what we know as this earth and what we know as the heavens, John in Revelation 21.1 saw a new heaven and new earth, and so we are going on out into eternity. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, we have a verse that says all of that is going to become a history. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former, former what? Whatever existed in the former prior to that time shall not be remembered nor come to mind. And so we're going to go on out into eternity, and we're going to live the most fantastic life you have ever dreamed of. The Apostle Paul makes a statement, something similar to this. I may be taking it slightly out of context, but he says that in the wildest flights of your imagination, and some of us have some pretty wild flights, in the midnight hour when you wake up out of a sleep and you had a hamburger and a a Pepsi Cola and a half a gallon of ice cream, and then you went back and had another hamburger and put the cheese and the tomato and the slice of onion on all of that and filled your stomach full and got in the bed and tried to lie down beside that mess and go to sleep. Why, well, you're bound to have uh, wildest flights of your imagination. <laughs> he, he says, in the wildest flights of your imagination, you cannot begin to imagine the things that God has gone to prepare for those that love him and keep his commandments. We read a portion of scripture at funerals. I go to prepare a place for you, 14.2. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And most ministers, most Bible students, most Bible teachers... They try to imply that God, and when I say God, in this case I'm meaning Christ, is up in heaven uh, building a, a building for you. And they even tell the story of sending up building materials, and they say what according to the way you send up materials is the way your place is going to be built and what it'll look like and so forth. But that's, that's not Scripture. He says, I go to prepare a place. What place? Not so much going up into heaven to build a place up in heaven. Heaven is going to be destroyed in the great fire during the white throne judgment. There's to be a new earth and new heavens. So if he was up in heaven building a place for you now, that means it's going to be destroyed by fire. But what he's doing, my friends, is he's preparing eventually on the new earth, a place where we will live forever and ever and ever. We'll have a new economy, new bodies. We'll be busy. We'll be rational beings. We'll be involved living on the new earth in the presence of God the Father and God the Son. That's why the Bible says that the pure in heart shall see God. And this doctrine of saying that nobody will ever see God, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the pure in heart shall see God. And when we arrive on the new earth in perfect bodies, we will be able to give perfect praise and perfect love on a perfect earth forever and ever in the presence of God Almighty and in the presence of His Son and will be there forever living in a whole new life. And that's what it's all about. I tell you, if you can ever grasp this great truth, it'll change your life. (laughs) It'll change your life the things of this little world will become so insignificant. Believe me, if you can ever grasp that, very few people do. Early in my ministry, I was taught this, and it took, it just took 
It got a hold of my heart and my whole life ambition down through the century, down through the years of time has been to teach this. And that's why I desire and a day never goes by, a night never closes that in prayer I ask God and beseech of God, God give me the facilities and give me the availabilities and give me the people around me who are interested in this very thing so we can show the world that there's a better way of life. I have an outline for you in the book of Revelation chapter 22. Actually, we go back into verse, into chapter 21 to pick up our thought. We go back to 21, beginning with verse 22. That's Revelation 21, verse 22 through chapter 22, verse 5. And that is called Life in New Jerusalem. Life in New Jerusalem. Chapter 21, verse 22 through 22, 5. And the second one is a plea to obedience. Verses 6 through 7 of chapter 22. Thirdly, a plea to work or to labor. Verses 8 through 12 and verse 14. And the fourth point is a plea to desire. Verse 13, verses 15 through 17, and verse 20. And fifthly, a warning to everybody, verses 18 through 19. And then we have the benediction in verses 20 through 21. Let's pick up our thought where we were in our last session. What's it going to be like in New Jerusalem? 21, 22, and I saw no temple there in for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. In the ancient city of Jerusalem, there's been a temple at various times. It's true that over the years, the temple have been destroyed. But basically speaking, there's been a temple or there's been an effort to rebuild the temple or there's been some type of a building where they could go and worship. Verse 23, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof. The glory of God, the Shekinah glory that was in the temple originally, that beautiful light that was there in the inner sanctum of the temple, this Shekinah glory of God, the same glory that came down on the top of Mount Transfiguration and blinded Moses. He literally had to wear a veil, you remember, when he came down the mountain. He had to put a curtain over his face because the pigment of his skin had so become saturated with the beautiful, bright glory of God Almighty that Moses had to wear a veil so it wouldn't affect the people in whom he contacted. Magnificent, my friends. We can't begin to grasp what God has for us. In the new Jerusalem, no need for the sun or the moon. The glory of God will lighten it. Jesus Christ will be there in person. It will be illuminated with a godly illumination. Verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, indicating that on the new earth, on out into eternity, there's going to be forms of government. We're not talking about heaven. We're talking about the eternal dispensation of time. There are going to be nations and forms of government. But yet, Jesus Christ will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it says, And the kings of the earth, the middle of verse 24, do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Now, when evening comes, we're tired and weary. And pretty soon after we've had our evening meal, we find ourselves going to bed to rest our bodies. 
because these bodies are made so that they endure throughout the day, but they must have rest at night. But there be no night there indicating in the new Jerusalem that we're going to have supernatural bodies. They will not tire, not get weary, not be ill, no dizzy spells, no death, eternal bodies, magnificent bodies. There shall be no night there. Verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it, enter into the holy city. No way under the sun shall there enter into that city anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. You're going to rid of the population right there. (laughs) the hardest thing politicians have to do after they're elected is trying to keep their campaign promises. Neither whatsoever worketh an abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life, the chapters and the verses are man-made. Shouldn't be any chapter here. Our verse, we'd go right on into 22.1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life. Way over here in Eden, you will remember, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, there was the tree of life. Way over here... In the new dispensation of time, we have the tree of life. Whatever happened there will be corrected here. And we know very little about what happened over here. And we know very little of what is going to transpire over here. But God, through his Holy Spirit, gives us enough so we do have a working knowledge of what it's going to be going to be a magnificent place. Terrific. We're looking at what the Scripture says relative to life in New Jerusalem. I'm looking at verse 2. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruit. Twelve is the complete heavenly number. The Bible is written in symbols or figures of speech or typical languages used, but you always look for a literal interpretation. Twelve, there will be enough food to feed us. There will be an ample variety of food. What we'll eat and all about it, we don't know. We don't know the details because for some reason or other, God hasn't revealed it to us. But he says in verse 2, There is the tree of life, which bear twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. That means there must be going to have seasons in the eternal dispensation because there are going to be months. And yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's going to be some kind of requirement of the nations of the earth at that time, that they do something, and the details we don't know, although we do know that here, in this period of time, that everybody has to go to Jerusalem once a year in this kingdom age 1,000-year rule. The Bible says everybody has to go to Jerusalem once a year to worship the Lord or the King of the Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ, And if they don't go, they do not get any rain, R-A-I-N. So Jesus Christ has the people of the earth doing something there, so it stands to reason that the people of the new earth are also going to be doing something. And there's worship connected with it. Magnificent. Beautiful. That's verse 2. Look at verse 3 through 5. And there shall be no more curse, 
But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. Going to see him. See his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. We're going to be identified some way with Jesus Christ in a manner that individuals can see. Verse 5, and there shall be no night there. It must be important because he said this up the way just a little bit, that there be no night there. Now he says it again. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And once we enter into this new dispensation or this eternal dispensation of time, living on the new earth in a glorified body, that's eternal, that is a perfect body, able to give perfect love and perfect praise to a perfect God throughout the never-ending ages of God's eternities, we'll just live there forever in a condition that far exceeds anything you ever thought heaven would be like. And that's forever. And uh, there will never happen in this eternity what originally happened in this eternity. Because when you read Genesis 1-1, it says God created heaven and the earth. A perfect creator created a perfect heaven and a perfect earth. But when you read Genesis 1-2, you find it is not perfect at that time. The Bible says it was without form and void in Genesis 1-2. But when we come to this eternity, it will always be a perfect heaven and a perfect earth, and we will reign with a perfect God and a perfect Christ in a perfect body forever and ever and ever, we'll be completely satisfied and happy. And Isaiah said in 65, 17, that the former things would not be remembered nor come to mind, and I thank God for that verse of Scripture. Because we've had a lot of heartaches, all of us have. We've had a lot of trouble and pain and misunderstanding and Things have happened in our past life that we're sorry of and we don't even like to think of them. But when we get there, it's all over with. You can hang your coat up, honey. You're finished. Throw your driver's license away. You've arrived. It's over with. You're there. You're home. Home at last and home to stay. Look at verses 6 through 7, our plea to obedience. And he said unto me, John the Apostle, the same man that was on the earth in what we now call the state of Israel with Jesus Christ for a little over three years was the man who received this whole revelation. And John is getting this vision, and someone said to him, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. That is, according to God's reckoning of time. Now, our reckoning of time, that wouldn't fit. You'd say, well, oh, that was 1,900 years ago. That's not right. But according to God's reckoning of time. According to God, which must shortly come to pass. Because God reckons time a little bit differently than we do. Because our whole lifespan is only 70, 75, 80 years. And so we have to compress and squeeze everything into three score years and ten. And anything outside of that, we, we get disturbed. We can't comprehend it. But God has been God because he always existed. There has never been one moment of time that God was not God. And we can't grasp it because it's beyond our thinking. Verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You notice right up to the very last moment, 
There is the invitation being extended to the unbeliever, to the sinner. Even though we are talking about the final dispensation of time, yet we are getting a forward look and a backward look. As you'll see as we proceed through the rest of chapter 22 of the book of Revelation. The plea to to obedience. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Let's look at verses 8 through 12 where we have a plea to labor. Verses 8 through 12 and verse 14. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now, John thought he was an angel. He looked like an angel, much like the commercial. It looks like tomato juice. It tastes like tomato juice. To John, look looked like an angel. It says so. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then said he, this angel unto me, See thou do it not. Don't fall down and worship me. No human being is supposed to fall down and worship any human being. We're all sinners. Some are sinners still in their sin, and some are sinners forgiven of their sin, but we're all sinners. And nobody is supposed to fall down and worship anybody when it comes to the realm of worship, true spiritual worship. Look what John is doing here in the instructions that he gets. The middle of verse 9. This person whom John thought was an angel, said, For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. This was a redeemed person from the earth that was especially appointed by Jesus Christ to discuss these matters with John. And he says, I'm not an angel. I'm redeemed from the earth. I'm one of your brethren. Verse 10. And he saith unto me, this individual, to John, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Seal not the sayings. But to Daniel, you remember, Daniel was told to seal them. Daniel, when he got through with the 12th chapter, or the book of Daniel, which we later divided into chapters, when he got to the end of it, the voice to Daniel was, seal it up. But not to John, don't seal it, leave it open. And this is the instruction from this heavenly person who said to John in verse 10, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand, according to God's reckoning of time. Verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. That is, if he won't repent. If he won't repent, let him be in his sins. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. In other words... If the people of this earth aren't going to change, don't worry about them. Pray about them. The Bible says weep over them. But if you pray about them and you weep over them and you do everything in your power to get them converted and they still resist your efforts, then don't worry about it because you've done all you can do. And that's why the Bible says, having done all, stand. God doesn't expect any more of you than doing your very best. And once you do your very best, that's it. God doesn't expect you to do any more. Having done all, stand. And that's what he's saying here in so many words in verse 11. Verse 12, and behold, I come quickly. And you see, he keeps giving these invitations all the way through. Doesn't stop, even up to the last minute. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. According as his work. 
once we're saved, we're supposed to work. We're involved in labor. Look at verse 14 in connection with this same thing about the plea to labor. Verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that do not read them or memorize them, but get involved, that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The plea to labor. Look at the plea to desire. In verse 13, we go back up now, one verse to pick up verse 13. The plea to desire, in other words, wanting everybody to become involved in this. 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In other words, Christ's always been in existence. He always will be in existence. I am the first, I am the last, I'm Alpha, I am Omega. Verses 15 through 17. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers. And I glanced at television a few minutes the other night, and some little 12-year-old girl just won some kind of an Academy Award. 12 years old, she won it by playing the part of a prostitute. If I had a child like that, I'd hang my head in shame and I'd never, never tell a soul about it. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. The book of Revelation, among all books, should be the book that is predominantly being taught in the churches. You teach the book of Revelation in a church, my friends, and you'll arouse the people. You go through this book for 22 weeks or 44 weeks, or 88 weeks, and there's plenty of material for 88 weeks, I tell you, your church will not be the same. Something will happen to it. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. That's why John was instructed over in the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation He was told there, write it, write it down and put it in a book or put it in letter form. Get it on parchment and send it to the churches. The seven churches of Asia Minor. Send it to the churches. Don't send it to the newspaper. Don't send it to Newsweek or Time or U.S. World News Report. Send it to the churches. The churches are the people that need this message. It's the pastors of the churches that should be telling this message and getting the people all alarmed and stirred up and aroused that the coming of the Lord is near. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. He's taking a backward look. He's not looking forward here. He's looking back. He says, I, Jesus, am the offspring, the root of David, bringing up his heritage. He's showing who he is. And the offspring of David in the bright and the morning star. Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Not only Jesus says, come. Not only God the Father says, come. But the Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, says come. The bride says come. Who's the bride? The saved of all ages who will make up the inhabitants of the new earth, the holy city, the new Jerusalem that John saw coming down from God out of heaven. The inhabitants of the new Jerusalem say to the whole world, come. A retrospective invitation. Come. Come. How's yourself in the new Jerusalem? 
in the holy city. These are vital messages. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst, Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Going to verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Would you look at the warning in verses 18 through 19? For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, he's talking about Revelation. We oftentimes apply this to the whole Bible. And you can, but the special instructions here concern only the book of Revelation. Because this book is so vital, it's so necessary. Listen to the instructions, looking at verse 18 through 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of heaven or out of the First Baptist Church, uh-uh, out of the holy city. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how exact God is? God is so exact. The Holy Spirit has been so meticulous in writing this thing so it could be absolutely no no degree of error in any way. God shall take away, in the middle of verse 19, shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And yet some men have the audacity to stand in front of their congregation and they will say, God never intended anybody to understand Revelation. God never intended anybody. Well, what did he have it put in here for? If that be true, then we could charge God with being an idiot. An idiot is somebody that does something and has no excuse or reasoning for having done it. It was put in the binding, the, between these two bindings, the book of Revelation with the other 65 books, it was put here to be read and to be understood and to comply with its instructions. And the warning is, if you dabble with that in any way, you're in trouble. Look at the benediction, verses 20 through 21. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Though there is much in the revelation that is mysterious, there is much that is practical as well. The book gives us a definite philosophy of history and a guide to personal faith and conduct. The unity of the book is in Christ. He is the one important figure in all of the action of this book. Whether it is discussing the church or the world of men or the universe of created beings or the kingdom of God to come, the new heaven and the new earth, all its thoughts center around Jesus Christ. He belongs to history because he was incarnate. He is above history because he sits on the throne of God. The aspect of his person stressed more than any other is his redemptive work 
And in the Revelation, his most prominent title is the Lamb as it had been slain. The progress of the Revelation is not always clear, I grant you, but it is discernible. Beginning with the assemblies of God's visible people on earth, Revelation speaks of the development of evil, of the conflict with Antichrist and Babylon, of the overthrow of the satanic rule of the earth, the final judgment, and the thousand-year administration of Christ on the earth, and the eternal paradise of God. The hope of the revelation is clear. God's people shall be purified. The system of evil shall be broken, and the kingdom of Christ must and shall come to pass. The knowledge of the revelation will not answer every detailed question that we can ask about present world politics, nor tell us how near we stand to the consummation. Nevertheless, the cry for a world government, which would put all civilization under one head, the rising tide of conflict in the Middle East, with Palestine as its center, the rapid expansion of missionary effort, that has brought a witness to many more of the tribes of the earth in our own generation, the enormous increase of crime and lawlessness in civilized lands, particularly in the United States, and the rising tide of religious apostasy make one wonder whether the symptoms of the climax described in Revelation are not appearing. Wherever we may be in God's calendar, the principles of this book hold good, and the gold of Christ's appearing cannot be too far away. So we conclude the book of Revelation, chapter 1 through chapter 22. Thank you, Dr. Estep, for a most interesting and helpful study in the book of Revelation. To help you further understand and grasp the true meaning of this mysterious book of Bible prophecy, the book of Revelation, Dr. Estep has asked me to suggest that you replay these tapes as soon as possible, using your Bible and going verse by verse as he teaches. We suggest you order a set for your minister or Sunday school teacher, because we believe they will enjoy and benefit greatly from this study. They may be reordered from World Prophetic Ministry, Colton, California, 92324.